president of the board. Uh, Kim Friedel has joined us as well. And a new board member, Corinne Elmore Stratton is also on the call with us from the board. And I believe there are some board members in attendance um, as attendees. I believe I saw Mrs. Carol Matlack and I'm not sure who else may be joining. So if they join, I'll try to mention them at the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. We also have a number, a number of staff members from the district who are with us again tonight. Some who have their cameras up and will have their cameras on during the course of the evening. Some who will be in reserve, ready to jump in to provide support and additional questions. Um, first, as, as we have done, a special thank you to Mr. Mark Plavinsky and Mr. Joe DiCarlo for our technology department who are managing this event for us as they do with so much that goes on in the district. So I'm grateful for these two gentlemen uh, and for what they continue to provide for us. And then our esteemed um, staff members from the district. Uh, first, Mr. Steve Redfern is with us again for the third time. Mr. Redfern is the president of the Cherry Hill Education Association, uh, and he is with us. Dr. Kwame Morton. Dr. Morton is the principal at Cherry Hill High School West. He's also representing the administrators in the district, the building principals, the supervisors, the assistant principals. Mrs. Jennifer DeStefano. Mrs. DeStefano is the student assistance counselor at Cherry Hill High School East, again joining us for the third time. Uh, Mrs. Barbara Case Abner. Uh, Mrs. Case Abner is the lead nurse for the district. That means that she is the, the nurse who's responsible for organizing everything that goes on with all of the rest of the nurses in the district. And she also, uh, in her day job, is the nurse at Beck Middle School. And then from the, the central administrative team, Ms. Nancy Adrian, who's the director of human resources, Dr. Ma Farah Mahan, who's the assistant superintendent, pre-K-12 and curriculum and instruction. Ms. LaCoya Wethington, the Assistant Superintendent for Equity, Compliance, and Student Services. Mrs. Barbara Wilson, the Public Information Officer. And Mrs. Lynn Sugars, the Assistant Superintendent for Business and Board Secretary. So as we have done, um, in, as we did in the last meeting, we're going to be alternating between live questions and questions that were submitted. Uh, I'm gonna ask Mrs. Neary to review with you how to ask questions if you are uh, in attendance with us this evening. Okay, thank you. So if you're joining us via the Zoom meet this evening, you will need to click the raise your hand button at the bottom bar of the meeting or dial star nine to raise your hand by phone. We will be called on by name or identified via phone number. A prompt will show on your screen asking if you want to unmute or if joining by dial in, hit star six to unmute your phone when prompted and you can begin speaking. And at the end of your three minutes, you will be muted. Very good. Thank you, Mrs. Neary. Uh, so again, just as a review, uh, we're gonna take questions. We'll start with a live question, somebody that's on the line uh, or in the Zoom, and we'll do one of the pre-submitted questions that I will read. Uh, the pre-submitted questions, again, folks submitted, uh, began submitting uh, the end of last week through noon today. Um, we do require people's names to be used. They can't be anonymous. Um, and we will not be reading um, just statements. We will be reading questions that were submitted. All right, Mrs. Neary, you feel good, ready to go? Yep, sounds good. And we'll be starting with um, the folks that have joined us on the line. And the first hand that I see is Melissa Bush. Okay. She is in. Okay. She can unmute. Okay, perfect. Uh, uh, Melissa Bush, 420 Lavender Hill Drive. Um, what does the district plan to do to address learning loss and a regression among the students, specifically those with IEPs? Is the district considering a more robust in-person summer program? If yes, please explain how it will operate. If not, what is keeping the district from implementing a more intensive program that mirrors what they should have received during the school year in terms of academics? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Um, Dr. Mayhan, Mrs. Wethington, do you two want to kind of go back and forth with this one a little bit? Absolutely. So I'll start off. Okay. Okay. So I really want to just start off. Ms. Bush, great question. Um, learning loss is something that we have talked about since the beginning of the pandemic. It has been a hot topic. And in, you know, that was in the first couple weeks. Now that we are almost a year into the pandemic, um, 
you know, I would say that we're educating students differently than we have in the past and then what parents are accustomed to, but we continue to implement our curriculum with fidelity. We're focusing on what we know and how we are addressing specific student needs. Many of our students have really grown through this, you know, what has been a very traumatic experience for many of them in ways as self-advocacy, their technology skills, um, building resiliency, organizational skills. And we just need to be um, focused on making sure that our students are prepared for college and career at the end of their academic career in Cherry Hill Public Schools. This is one very small and unfortunate time during their career, but we continue to prepare them um, in many ways. There's a similar question that was submitted um, by someone and they also wanted to know, are we sharing data around marking period grades and having that conversation? Members of the board who are on this call, um, who are members of the curriculum and instruction committee of the board can attest that at our January meeting, we had all of the secondary principals present to the board around marking period grades and what are they doing to address the needs of students in the building who are not meeting with success in the remote model? I'll stop talking for a second just to pause so that Mrs. Weddington can jump in. And then I will go back to the Title I summer pro program that we offer uh, campaign. And then I'll also ask Dr. Morton to chime in with information regarding the presentation that was given to the CNI Committee of the Board. So Mrs. Weddington. So uh, from the perspective of the extended school year, we will um, offer ESY this summer. We will extend the length. We will actually be discussing this with the board tomorrow uh, so as to provide children opportunities for additional learning time, understanding that um, children did not always have access to uh, some of their services during COVID. And similar for campaign, which is the Title I summer program provided for students in grades K through four at the elementary schools. Uh, the program has been extended by a few days because based on the grant and the funding source, we are not able to start that program until after the July 1 start date. And we are running that program into August, again, to meet the needs of um, students who qualify for Title I services. And Dr. Morton, I don't know if you want to chime in in regards to the presentation that the secondary principals provided to the CNI committee of the board last week. Yes, absolutely, uh, Dr. Mahan. So, uh, so uh, great opportunity to spend some time and just to talk about uh, what it is that we we've been trying to do and, and focus on with students. I think the, the you know the the, the thing that's uh, most important to understand is this idea that. We are learning as we are moving forward and we are adapting as we're moving forward. Um, our implementation of um, this virtual or remote model is very different than what it was last year in March when we, when we shut down. Um, as we move forward, I think you know, we, we continue to grow and, and adapt and to try to meet uh, students' needs. Uh, what we've seen overall, I mean, we, we have seen that our students um, have been successful. It's much similar, to, quite frank, to, to, to the regular school year with the exception of we've seen probably more students um, experience success, but we have seen a pocket of students that have difficulty in the current setting. Um, have we seen that number of students grow? There hasn't necessarily been a number of students that are struggling to grow, but the students that are having difficulties during this time um, need additional support. And, and definitely, you know, would uh, benefit from those face-to-face -face touches with us. Uh, we are looking forward. I'm sure we're going to talk more about students return to school next week. We're looking forward to the return of, of students next week. Um, teachers are prepared and ready to go and, and actually uh, are inspired by the return, inspired by this idea of the return of students to, uh, to school and to the building. So, as I said, it's, it's a work in progress. We are um, adapting and, and growing and, and working and moving forward, um, but definitely looking forward to our students' return. Great, thank you, Dr. Morton. Thank you, Dr. Mahan. Thank you, Mrs. Weathington. Um, the only thing that I will add just very briefly to that, Mrs. Bush and to others, um, is last summer, you know, through our curriculum office, 
uh, with support from principals and, and the curriculum supervisors. You know, we had posted um, opportunities and information for children to stay engaged and to work on during the course of the summer. I expect that we'd be doing something similar during the course of this summer as well. Um, more to come on that later in the spring uh, about structurally what that will look like. Right, Dr. Right. Malasar, what, um, I'm sorry. I no, want no, to ahead, also, Mr. Redfern, thanks. I want to also add that we, um, we're in discussions and we should be moving forward with the summer reading project that we did. Yes. Pride last year. So we'll be trying to uh, replicate that again for the um, exiting elementary kids into middle school. That's great. Just, we talked about it today, so. That's great. Thank you, Steve. Very good. All right, our first submitted question uh, comes from Marion Felix. And her question is, my granddaughter is not doing well with remote learning. When will the students be able to return to school? Uh, so Ms. Felix, we are, are scheduled for January 19th, which is next Tuesday uh, in the hybrid model, which means our cohort A students will be in school on Tuesday and Thursday. Our cohort B students will be in school on Wednesday and Friday, uh, and we will be set to go. Uh, we've been preparing and planning. The structure has been put out there. The announcement of when is about the January 19th date goes back to November 20th. Um, so we are set to go for January the 19th. Um, Mrs. Neri, back to the live questions. Okay, great. Uh, the next person we have is Brian. And Brian, if you could state your full name and address. Brian is in, there he goes. Uh, yes, actually it's, this is my husband's computer. It's Ebony Stoke at- <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Stoke. <laughs> Ashley Court, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. <laughs> Very good. Great. How are and you tonight? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks again uh, for you guys' uh, doing this live uh, meeting, by the way, uh, so everyone can stay informed and get all their questions answered. Um, thanks for joining us. My main question was, um, I'm a little early, but um, I have a kindergartner that will be in the 2021-2022 school, school year, and we were trying to find out, I know it's early, I know we're, we're going back to 2021 right now, <laughs> but do you guys have any idea of what the schedule will be like for kindergartners? Um, will it be hybrid? Will it be full day for your planning that you're doing right now? Um, and, uh, or will it be remote? Um, when will the online registration go live for us to try to register everyone for this fall? Um, and do you have any updates about the, uh, the SAC, the before and after care? Um, you know, when will that be online and what's the process going to be moving forward? Um, but that was it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ms. Stokes. Um, actually, I do have, uh, we have some answers to those. I can ask Mrs. Wethington. We honestly, Ms. Stokes, this morning, we're talking about kindergarten registration for this year. Um, uh, Dr. Mayhem, Ms. Wethington and I. So Ms. Wethington, you want to talk a little bit about registration and then we'll talk about, you know, the, the school year. And can you, can you talk about SAC too, Ms. Bethington? Sure. Mm -hmm. So kindergarten registration will begin um, in a couple weeks. We will be providing the registration online this year. Typically, we would do it in person. Last year, we started in person and then had to switch due to the, to the COVID closure. So we will do everything online. So the portal will open. You will be able to go in and input your child's information as a pre-registration, and then we'll have increased capacity. You'll be able to uh, upload documents, and the registration office will be able to process and assign your child to a school. Uh, you will not get that assignment immediately. It will take a little while, but we will process all of that um, on the website. And as far as SAC goes, SAC registration should open around the same time. We typically do SAC registration when we do kindergarten registration. So SAC will be available also. And Ms. Wellington, again, did you, did you give a date as to when we expect that will start? Uh, we are a little ahead of the game, Dr. Malash, with kindergarten registration. It's normally like late February, totally do March. So um, I would say the SAC registration might be a little bit delayed from the kindergarten registration, which we think is going to be around the 25th on or around. Okay. And all that information will be on our website. It Mrs. will be Wilson, on our, our website soon. Right. And Mrs. Wilson, our public information officer, she'll be pushing that information out uh, as well. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, you can always go through the public information portal. You can contact us directly, contact one of the schools or your neighborhood school. Um, and you know, our, I know our principals 
um, we'll be able to address those as well. Uh, in terms of what will September look like for school attendance, um, we are early uh, to be able to, to say um, right now. Ideally, everybody's back in school five days a week, full time, staff and students. That's the ideal, that's our goal of where we wanna be with that. Um, but there's a lot that has to happen between now and then. I expect that we won't be able to make a firm commitment to what September is going to look back look like um, probably until about the end of the academic year in June uh, of this year. Uh, and again, that comes through the Department of Health, uh, through the, the Department of Education at the state level recommendations. But our goal is for students and staff to be in school together uh, when that takes place. So thanks, Ms. Stokes. Uh, a submitted question from June Garifano. And she says, given the fact that the newer, more contagious strain of the virus is in the US and it seems to affect children, have you taken this into consideration when determining when to return to hybrid learning? Uh, this actually has been a part of our discussion with the County Department of Health. Um, since mid-November, uh, all of the superintendents in Camden County, along with the Executive County Superintendent, meet with Dr. Nawako, uh, who's the County Health Director and members of his staff this has been part of our discussion uh, about whether there will be an impact uh, with the new strain that, that has um, been identified and you know, has been found in, in a handful of states at this point uh, and what that looks like. Um, we have not been advised that there's a reason for us to adjust our schedule or what we are doing based on that at this point. If there is a change, certainly we'll let folks know uh, as soon as information comes out um, from those who manage uh, on the public health side. All right, and Mrs. Neary, back to the live. Dr. Malash, while you're waiting, Dr. Malash yep. and Mrs. Neary, while you are waiting to go to the next question, can we please just remind all panelists that they need to be muted when they are not speaking? Oh, good point. As Thank Dr. Mahan said, make sure everybody's muted if you're not talking. Thanks, Dr. Mahan. Mrs. Neary? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and it could be me because I was unmuted. So hopefully it wasn't the background noise here. So I apologize. Um, I think the next person that we have on the line is Amy Wynn Dworkin. And I hope I said that right. So I apologize if I didn't. Um, so go ahead, remember to state your name and address. Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Amy Wynn Dworkin. I'm at 10 West Eagle Lane in Cherry Hill. Um, I have three kids in the system, one in high school and two at Cooper Elementary. Um, I am wondering, um, I, I'm not gonna say that nobody, but I'm super excited that my kids might be going back to school two days a week. Um, but I am a little bit concerned that we're not necessarily sending them back with the best information about everyone's situation. Um, specifically, um, I'm going to ask the question, why is the district not planning to do surveillance testing for COVID, testing maybe 5 to 10 percent of the population in each school, so that when we're making decisions to be open, we're making more accurate decisions based on the population within the schools that are there. And um, um, if you could articulate a little bit about why that's not happening. Um, and um, I, I'd just like to know a little more about that. Thank you, Ms. Mendork, and I, I appreciate the question. Ms. Case Abner, do you wanna, do you wanna say anything about, I don't know whether you guys have had any discussion about testing. Um, we are not, I can tell you, um, Ms. Dworkin, that we have not, we did not purchase tests, we don't own tests. Uh, that is not something that has been advised or directed to us by the CDC uh, or the Department of Health or the Department of Education um, to do that either in mass um, of testing everybody uh, or as, as you referred to, and I appreciate the term, the surveillance testing, um, you know, where there's a percentage of um, students or staff to be tested. Um, we are just not in a situation, we don't have policy for that, we don't have guidelines, and we could not require um, the testing to take place um, to do it. Um, really are the, the foundational pieces. Sure. sure. Dr. Malash, I know yes. that um, private schools are using this to make sure that their kids are safe. And 
I also know that some public charter schools in New Jersey are using that system. So I know we're a big district, but I'm just a little disheartened to hear that there's absolutely no plan to do it. And I feel a little bit like we're sending our kids blindly back. Right, I understand your frustration and concern. Um, you know, it's one of the challenges of different guidelines, you know, being a, a public school district, um, you know, regardless of our size that we have to deal with uh, in terms of compliance and what we can do and what we cannot do. Um, so I, I understand, Ms. Dworkin, um, you know, I understand. Okay. Thank you Thank for you. calling in. And then we'll go back to submitted questions. Um, this is from Christy Stokes. And the question is, do all students need to return hybrid or is it a choice with the new virus now in PA and being that it is even more contagious, is this really a good time to return to hybrid? Um, so no, all children do not need to return to hybrid. Uh, children may remain on um, full remote. Uh, parents have the right and the opportunity in our district to make that choice uh, for their child. As we went into November and where we are right now, uh, as a district, we still hover around 50% of our families, uh, the families have identified hybrid instruction for the children and about 50% of our families have identified for remote instruction for their children. Um, if any families have a specific question or would like to make a change from where they are, and if you're not sure where your child is, if you log into Genesis uh, through the parent portal, you'll be able to see um, if it says remote, then your child is a remote. If it says cohort A, then your child without remote, then your child's in cohort A. If you have questions about that, contact um, your child's principal or school counselor, uh, and they can assist you um, in the next pieces. And then we talked a little bit about the um, new strain of the virus. And then this is Neary back to the live side. Okay, great. As it's quieter, I think I was the background noise, the challenges of being remote. Um, so the next we have is Carolina Bevid. Hi, um, Carolina Bevid, 1213 Cropwell Road. My question is um, about Governor Murphy. He today unveiled some information from his latest executive order. And one item is that student growth objectives will be removed from educator evaluations. So my question is, will Cherry Hill be following this executive order? And if so, what does it mean for how the fidelity of the curriculum will be assessed by the district? And also, if you could just touch on how you'll identify those pockets of students who need additional help potentially over the summer as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Bevan. Uh, Mr. Redfern or Dr. Morton or Dr. Mann, do you want to talk about what SGOs are first? Um, I can let, I mean, it's up to, I can let Farah maybe or Dr. Morton explain what it is and then maybe the, my belief on how it'll, despite the executive order, it could still be used for teachers if you want to do I don't I don't know how you how you want to progress with the order to ex best explain the answer <laughs> um well let's talk first just talk about um what SGOs are just so because I, I'm going to assume that, that most of the community or, or parents that are on um probably are not necessarily familiar with SGOs as, as a snapshot uh and what that means well I, I think I'll defer to Dr. Morton because he probably has both the SGOs and SGPs in his building that piece. <laughs> sorry about that Dr. Morton Oh, no, 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 not a problem at all. Yes, yeah, so SGO is student growth objective. So essentially what it is, is uh, teachers establish uh, a growth goal for a particular um, group of students that they're working with annually on each year. Um, it's, they, these are goals that we actually track uh, and monitor via um, an assessment. Um, so it's tracked throughout the year and it's actually included on, on the teacher evaluation score. It is a measure that we use to determine overall progress and effectiveness, uh, but it's just one measure. So we, we do use multiple measures um, to measure um, student learning ultimately. I mean, that's, 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 that's what we are um, aiming for and that's what we're, we're looking at. Uh, a bigger 
more impactful um, tool that we use as administrators to ensure that there's fidelity in the curric curriculum would be the teacher evaluation process. So as part of the teacher evaluation process, all teachers um, receive what's called the formal observations. Uh, the administrators um, go into the classrooms and observe teachers as they uh, practice, ultimately. Uh, so you take them through an entire process, uh, pre-planning pre process, implementation process, and then following that, a reflectionary process where we talk about uh, what was planned, what was executed, and steps for uh, improvement. And again, everything is tied back to, to how well students are grasping the curriculum. Um, so I, I think that's the, that's the major way that we, that we measure the fidelity of the curriculum. And SGOs are a piece of that, but it's the everyday ongoing formal and informal observations that take place that really paint the picture for us uh, about how well our, our students are learning and, and how effective our teachers are. We just, just had, and I appreciate that explanation, Dr. Martin, and I think very thorough. I, I think one of the other, you know, the, the, the significance of it is more of removing it from the teacher evaluation than it is you know, for an overall performance for a student for the course of the year, because it's such a focused um, this type of piece that, that goes in there. Uh, Dr. Mann, do you want to talk a little bit about um, just the overall um, can I, I, about, oh, I'm sorry, I, don't cut, I don't want to cut Dr. Mahan off, but I'll, I'll <laughs> just share from the, I apologize, Dr. Mahan. Um, you know, and, and Dr. Morton mentioned, <laughs> Dr. Morton mentioned the idea of, you know, it being attached to assessments. I mean, assessments are still happening, you know, so, you know, like that piece is still there and teachers will be using assessments, you know, administration looks at assessments to see the student growth. So, you know, Dr. Malachi said it's it's more something that's tied at a different level because we're not getting rid of assessments and we're not looking at students and we're not looking at their, you know, growth. We, we're doing those things. Those things are still happening. Um, so that thread is still there. And, you know, as Dr. Morton mentioned that, you know, a lot of the student growth objectives are attached to, you know, assessments that, you know, the district provides or the teachers are using or whatever. So that still is there. Um, so it is a little, um, confusing to see that you know put out by the governor and then it you know because it's not like a one sentence statement doesn't really clarify exactly what you know those SGOs really do do and what part of that you know piece the assessments hold so I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to Dr. May now. <laughs> Thanks Mr. Redfern. <laughs> Thank you Mr. Redfern. I think you have all covered it pretty well. The only things that I will add I'm not sure if anyone said at the beginning SGO actually stands for Student Growth Objective, which is important for our community members to know. But I think you hit all of the key points in, in determining progress, um, multiple measures, informal and formal observations, assessments, informal and informal, to ensure that our curriculum is being implemented with fidelity. So I think all of those points were touched on. And like like everything you know that that deals with the guidelines and and the requirements for our staff or for our students, um, the easy parts for the governor to make the announcement at a press conference today. Um, the more challenging part now is for the Department of Ed to work through what does that mean and go through guidelines and regulations and then send that out to us. Um, in Cherry Hill, we have a, a district evaluation advisory committee um, that Dr. Morton and Mr. Redfern both sit on. It's made up of staff members and administrators from across the district. This is the group that we work with. Um, you know, when, when talking about SGOs and um, it's a, a well represented and, and robust group of folks. Um, so we'll take that to them as well um, to have additional discussions. So I appreciate your comments. All right. And now a submitted question. Um, this is from Jeffrey Zangrilli. Has the administration surveyed teachers on learning loss so far this academic year? Has the district compared the end of marking period grades on report cards in Genesis? To those from the same quarter last year to see what level students are at compared to the same time last year in the same grade. This information should be made public. Will the district be offering remedial instruction to compensate and address areas where students are falling behind? Um, Barrett or Dr. Mahan and Dr. Warren, you guys mentioned this uh, in an earlier response. Just want to kind of hit on the, the big points again. 
Yeah, so, so this was a, a topic of discussion at the CNI meeting of the Board of Education. This is what Dr. Mahan alluded to a bit earlier in the conversation. Uh, so we, we actually did, uh, all, all the, the secondary schools presented it and we um, presented the data com as compared um, to last year. So last year's market period one compared to this year's market period one. And again, what we found is that we have students more students, more students in terms of the number are receiving higher grades, uh, but we do have a cadre or pocket of students that um, that are that are having difficulty with uh, the separation from school, and those kids uh, have failed multiple subjects. So we are we're we're we're, we're working. That's what I was I was sort of uh, alluding to as well when I said that we're learning and we're growing. We're we're uh, adapting to try to find creative and unique and innovative ways to meet their needs, whether that be um, homework clubs after school that even run well into the evening or uh, tutorial opportunities during the day, um, opportunities to meet with peers and things along those lines um, in terms of, of support groups also. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, as a parent also, and for those that, that know me, uh, I have four, four children still in the, um, K to 12 school system, it's tough. I mean, I, you know, I, I see it every day for myself. You know, one of my sons in ninth grade, not a problem. My 10th grader, he needs that eyeball to eyeball, as I call it. Uh, so we're working through it as a family and we're working with him. And I think the important thing as well is to, uh, to ensure that we're communicating with the educators. So we, we communicate intently with, uh, with my son's teachers and it's this collaboration and communication that that's very important if there's a specific need that your child has we want to hear what that need is and and we're we're willing to do whatever it takes at this point to help um, our children to be successful each each and every one of them so that's what's important so the collaboration and communication as well i believe that's great dr. thank you dr Martin. yes mr stefano just wanted to remind you um just going on to Dr. Morton's um, comments that all the counselors, guidance and SACs and all the buildings are also there for anyone who needs to get information. So not only just the teachers, but also the support system within the school. Excellent. Thank you. Huge piece of the team. And we have counselors in all of our schools, right? Take advantage of them while they're there. Good. Thank you, folks. Um, Mrs. Neary, back to live. Yes, the next person we have is M. So if uh, you could state your full name and address, that would be great. Thank you. They are in, they just need to unmute. As Ms. Sneary said, it's, it shows up as M, just a single initial for us. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't give anything else. Not sure if we lost them. I don't see them in the yeah, attendees. Yeah, I don't see them anymore. All right, you wanna go down to the next one? Sure, we'll come back. Uh, the next individual we have is Zane Ribsby, sixth grade. Um, hi, oh, okay, um, yeah, this is the wrong name, but um, my name is uh, Nosheen Mehdi. Uh, my son is in uh, um, middle school. And I live on Garwood Street, Garwood Road. Mm -hmm. um, so, good evening. I'm sorry? I said good evening. Okay, good evening. Um, my question is, I've never sent my son to um, hybrid schedule. So just want to make sure the, um, the timing is eight to one. And also how many students are, like what, do you, what are you guys, what the precautions are for COVID? Like, is there a maximum amount of students that can be in a classroom? Are the teachers going to be changing or the kids are going to, into different school, like classes? Mm. Like, I just don't know all that stuff. Excellent. Thank you for your question. Uh, I appreciate you calling in tonight. So yes, Dr. Mayan, eight to one at the middle school, right? Is that the, I believe it's, it's finished at before one o'clock. That is correct. It is, well, what I was going to say in response is um, I highly recommend, and 
Dr. Morton. Dr. Mann, we're, we're losing you a little bit there. Can you hear me now? No. So I will talk a little bit about just uh, what our mitigation practices are. Um, if you'll take a look at the time for middle school, um, and then we'll come back to you. So the mitigation practices, you know, one of our goals has been to be able to maintain six feet uh, of social distance in all of the classrooms, you know, where the children are going to be based on the numbers. Um, we believe that we uh, can successfully do that in the classrooms. Our staff members will also be working with students about, um, you know, when they are in the hallways, because there is a time when they arrive at school and get to their room. Uh, in the middle schools, as much as possible, the students will be remaining in the classroom and the staff members will rotate and go to the different rooms. That's a little bit easier in sixth grade than it is in seventh grade and a little bit easier in seventh grade than it is in eighth grade based on the different choices that children have at those grade levels. Um, kids always have to wear a mask while they are in school. Um, there is hand sanitizer in every classroom and in every space. Um, they'll be reminded about hand sanitization, about not touching, not being in contact with their peers or with anything else, um, wiping down their desk uh, when they are through with it at the end of class, throwing the wipes away. Um, all of that exists uh, within the classroom. And again, our practice, part of the things that our staff members will be going over as they did you know, when the students first came back in hybrid in November is what that structurally looks like on a daily basis in the school. Um, and again, what the kids need to, uh, what they need to do to do that. Um, and again, the middle school time, Dr. Mann, how do you, do you think you're back? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, much better. Okay, I apologize. I'm having some technical difficulty and I was switching between Wi-Fi and a hotspot. So I apologize. So the time for the middle school is eight to 1216. Dismissal is at 1230. And then students have lunch and they are expected to be in their extension periods in the afternoon from 130 until three o'clock. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Mahan. And now back to the submitted questions. This is from Zoe Zangrilli. Um, it says, are there sufficient teachers willing to return to the classroom to return to hybrid on January 19th? And then two, will building principals be auditing remote learning classes to ensure quality, fidelity to the curriculum, and most importantly, gauge student engagement? Um, so yes, as of today, um, we firmly believe that we're prepared with staffing for Tuesday, January the 19th. Um, securing substitute teachers is something that we have been working on. Substitutes in New Jersey has been a challenge for a number of years that's been exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, we've been going through a process where we've been hiring additional long-term replacement staff members to have them with us now through the end of the academic year to help with uh, when substitutes are needed. Um, and building principals will continue to be visiting um, remote classes, uh, doing drop-ins. I know it's been, uh, when we get together with the principals and um, I do that you know, once a month with all the principals together and then with the elementary principals once and middle school and high school. Some of my favorite times are hearing the stories from them uh, about when they join a class today or when they join a class the other day with what they saw and what the engagement looked like and talking to the students. Um, it, it always is a, is a highlight. But yes, they will continue to do that uh, as we continue to progress through the winter and into the spring. Dr. Dr. Moss, I think there was, right, Mr. Redford. Yeah, there was also part of the governor's thing today about the, uh, I think the extension of certified teachers for subs. Extending the time frame that they can. Yes. Yeah. So that'll be a plus, right? Yeah. So in the governor's announcement, he talked about, is it substitute teachers extending the amount of time? I think it's, yeah, certified teachers to be, so I don't know exactly, again, it was the sentence, but the sure there's a right? explanation from the Department of Ed, but it sounded like it would be something that would obviously help districts, I, I yes. hope. Yeah, talking with something that would, you know, when the, the superintendents in Camden County get together with our executive county superintendent, something we discuss all the time, um, you know, one, is there a way to relax the the challenges so that people can substitute uh, and two is about recruitment of subs because it's an issue throughout the state for sure. Thanks, Mr. Redfern. Mrs. Neary, back to the live side. Yes, yeah, Mrs. Neary, Mrs. Neary and Dr. Malas, this is just a reminder that it is 742. Oh, thank you, Dr. Mahan. Thank you. You're welcome. Um,
Before we went to the next question, actually, I was just wondering if Dr. Mahan could explain or expand a little on that extension period at the middle school level in the afternoon, just so that everyone's clear on that, because I'm not sure if everybody is. Good question, Mrs. Neary. Yes, great question, Mrs. Neary. So the extension period was put into place at the middle school after the first or maybe second or third iteration of the hybrid learning schedule based on feedback from students, parents, and teachers. And in order to be, to be able to provide targeted intervention and enrichment for students at the middle school level, it was determined by the committee that the periods in the afternoon would be used for a variety of academic as well as other services for students. So students may be participating in music lessons, they may be getting additional support in math, they could be um, participating in a book club with the classroom teacher, they could be participating in social emotional learning lessons. So the time in the afternoon is divided up by the team that your that children are on in the middle school, and then the activities are further determined by the teachers and needs of students. Does that answer, Mary? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and then I believe we have as an attendee, Melissa, Melissa Bush. Let's come back around again. Oh, or maybe that was. Yeah, I don't. Okay, um, we'll go to Lindsay Abesh. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, how are you, Lindsay? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Lindsay Abish, 506 Heartwood, and a teacher in the district. I just wanna start by thanking you all. I know none of you have an easy job, so thank you for all the work you're doing. I was just wondering, what are the quantitative and qualitative measures that the board and you, Dr. Malash, are looking at when working with the health department to determine that Monday is safe to open when, or Tuesday rather, when based on data that I've seen, numbers are higher than they were when we closed in November. And as others have touched upon with the new strain, if you can just touch upon that a little bit. Sure, thanks, Lindsay. Um, so there's a number of things that, that we look at in consultation with the Department of Health. Uh, one of the primary source documents that we use, you know, is the weekly Cali report that comes out from um, the New Jersey Department of Health that goes through and, um, you know, it, it's that right now currently identifies uh, the southwest region of the state of which Camden County is part of Camden and Burlington County uh, has us in orange or the uh, high risk category, um, which we've been for, you know, since the, the mid November um, at this point. We look at the rate of transmission, um, which has been below one recently. Look at the number of cases um, that they, on average, uh, positive cases per day, the number of people that are being tested um, and the percent positivity rate. Uh, and then they take all of that together to make the determination about what category we fit in, everything from green up to red. Uh, and we have stayed to be continuing uh, in the orange category. So that's some of the, the, the hard data that we look at about what those actual numbers are. We can actually find out more um, specific or specifically about the numbers in Cherry Hill. Um, you know, and they share numbers about um, the age bands um, where the positive test results have come, um, you know, and, and what that looks like. So we use that information. Um, and then we also look at, you know, just the, the overall impact on community. One of the determinants, you know, when we made the determination on November the 20th, um, to close following Thanksgiving and to remain, you know, in the full remote status for everybody. Um, honestly, came from a lot of discussion we have with folks uh, and with staff, you know, families and with staff in the community, just about the challenges of, you know, changing from one week to the next. Um, and there are some of our neighboring districts who honestly, you know, between Thanksgiving and the winter break, were open and closed multiple times, you know, during the course of those four weeks. Um, we did not believe with everything that was going on and with the responses that we received that our community was going to be able to continue to bear that 
where they would wait until Thursday every week to find out whether we'd be in person the following week, or whether on remote instruction. So having all that information between the quantitative and the qualitative that was presented to us, made the determination to wait until January 19th to reopen, to give the two weeks following the winter break. Um, you know, and, and we a lot of people have asked questions about fidelity. One of the things I have to remind uh, our families and our staff members about is just the fidelity with health uh, and how important washing hands, wearing masks, following the guidelines, not just in the short time the kids are in staff or in school, but on the outside as well, not being exposed. And when you are exposed, reporting that, um, filling out that information, doing the daily health checks. If the parents and kids are practicing the daily health checks every day, we require our staff members to do it every day. I do it every day um, you know, to go through something that's so incredibly important. So those are all the different pieces. Um, I'm not believing that we are in a worse situation currently than we were in November, um, that we are able to, based on our numbers, um, reopen the schools to the hybrid model uh, on Tuesday, January the 19th. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. And then submitted, um, this is from Bruce Blatt. Uh, and he says, after reviewing the continued reports provided by the New Jersey Department of Health, what gives the district enough confidence that a return to school is appropriate at this time? For the Southwest region data, the case rate percent CLI and percent positive have all doubled from 11 7 2020 report to the 1 2 2021 report. Um, so, again, uh, some of this I just talked about with the, the question from Ms. Habish um, that she asked Southwest region remains in the orange high risk status. Um, we meet with the Camden County Health Director every week. Um, Dr. Nawako meets with all of the superintendents in the county and the executive county superintendent. We review the weekly reports from the state, analyze the reality of the numbers, what they mean um, in Camden County and in our own municipalities, uh, specifically for us for Cherry Hill. Um, I believe that we uh, are prepared to open on the 19th. All right, Mrs. Neary. Okay, next we have Corinne Driscoll. And Corinne, if you can go ahead and give your address as well. Hi there. Um, I'm at 12, hi there, I'm at 1205 Pam's Path in Cherry Hill. Um, and my question is, um, um, how, does the school how does the school district plan to celebrate our staff during this global pandemic? Um, I, for one, uh, would like to acknowledge my fifth grade son's learning team, which includes Leanne Bernowski and Jean Parkett A. Russell Knight. Um, during this challenging time, they have been very understanding, compassionate, available, and helpful. And my son has had a very, very good experience with remote learning this school year. Um, his teacher and the support within his virtual LLD classroom is phenomenal, as are his providers for his PTOT speech and behavioral services. Um, he's got a lot going on in his IP, and, um, and it was just reevaluated a few weeks ago. Um, and the virtual limited exposure reevaluation process was not stressful at all, thanks to this learning team. Um, and I do realize that this isn't every student's or family's experience, but I do think it's important to acknowledge all experiences and the staff and the learning teams, um, you know, when it's deserved. Thank you, Ms. Driscoll. I, I appreciate that. Um, there are you know, individual ways that staff have been celebrated at the different buildings. Um, we will continue to celebrate staff. It's, it's you know, by the work that our incredible staff has done during the course of the last 10 plus months um, that have kept it going for our kids and for one another. Um, you know, the, the most important thing is that relationship that exists between our teachers and their students, um, you know, in terms of the connection and the learning. Uh, and our staff members have gone, there are countless stories that I continue to hear of our staff members going above and beyond making connections with students. I was uh, in a conversation before this meeting, you know, talking about some of our high school teachers um, and how they have gone above and beyond to make connections with their kids so that they know who they are as people and as individuals. Because for some, this experience has been so challenging and so damaging in so many ways, truly a traumatic experience. Um, so we will continue to celebrate staff. Uh, I know that our PTAs um, have done great celebrations for our staff members at the schools. Um, we've talked about it with our board members. We've talked about it in board meetings. Um, and we will continue to acknowledge and to thank them for what they do. Um, the human resource is always the most important resource in our school district. That's those 1,700 employees from the cleaners and custodians and maintenance and facilities folks, the secretaries, educational assistants, the teachers, the child study team members, the administrators, the secretaries, the folks in the business office and transportation. Um, those 1,700 people 
are what keep this district going and make it possible for our kids to learn. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, a, a great reminder and a, and a great piece. Thank you so much, Ms. Driscoll. Thank you. Um, Dr. Malas, if I just um, add to that, I know when we meet with the, the zone PTA, you know, they have brought this up about how, you know, you know, the keep, you know, how can we display that to the teachers? And I think, you know, so sometimes, you know, we forget about the simple, you know, little email, you know, saying, hey, you know, thanks for everything you've done. You know, I know it's a difficult time. So, you know, I would, you know, I, you know, in response to Ms. Driscoll's question, I, I think that sometimes we undervalue that quick note or that, yes. you know, quick email to a staff member or teacher or administrator saying, thanks, I appreciate that. You know, I don't know what we would be doing without you as my son's teacher, daughter's teacher. So, you know, you know, teachers aren't, in, you know, and, and Dr. Morton will attest this, aren't going to come out and say, hey, you could do this for me. You know, like, <laughs> but that, I mean, I can speak on, you know, behalf of, you know, being a teacher, you know, and, you know, my wife, you know, being a kindergarten teacher that, you know, you save those notes that you get from kids or parents or, you know, and you put them somewhere because, you know, that, you know, makes your day and makes it all worth it. So um, for parents that are listening, you know, do those little things, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be, you know, an extravagant, you know, even if you have a great correspondence with the school secretary, you know, send a quick email, hey, thank you for getting me all the information. I really appreciate it. Um, I think it goes a long way, you know. Steve, I think that's such a great point. Thank you for saying that. Uh, and you're right. I have, I have a box here in my office that has notes, some of them that are almost 30 years old. You hold on to it, right? That stuff that makes a difference, right? That, that connection, that, that, that kindness. I think that's fantastic. Thank you for stating that. Um, one of the submitted Dr. Malash, may I also, Dr. Yes. Malash, may I also chime in on this one? You may. Dr. I just may wanted in. to say, Perfect. I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Mrs. Driscoll for her comments and just to affirm for her that there are approximately 350 attendees on this call and approximately 100 of them are teachers from Cherry Hill Public Schools. And they all heard the wonderful shout out and praise that you just offered to members of the Russell Knight teaching and learning community and that will speak more volumes than anything that we will be able to say to them. We recognize that our teachers are working extremely hard. They have gone above and beyond during this pandemic. And I've said this to many staff members, you know, in the absence of a playbook or in, in, in the absence of directions, we are writing our own playbook. And your acknowledgement of the teaching staff and for so many of them to be able to hear it is powerful. And for any parent, as Mr. Redfern said, who was on this call, you know, we know that we have not done everything right. But I can tell you this, we are learning from this experience and our teachers are working harder than they have ever worked before to ensure that the students of Cherry Hill Public Schools are receiving a high quality education during this unprecedented time. So Ms. Driscoll, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahan. Uh, a submitted question. This is from Benjamin Schur. My question is for the Cherry Hill Board of Education members. Why are you hiding your meeting when the public has, dema has demanded accountability and transparency? Please live stream any and all meeting, regardless if they are a committee or a full board meeting. We need transparency and we need accountability. Your constituents request your attention. Okay. This is Neary, do you want to? Yeah, this? I can go ahead and, and field that one. Thank you, Dr. Malash. So I just wanna note and appreciate um, the concern and seeing various community members express the concern. Um, in prior to COVID, we did open public meetings for our committee meetings. And then as we shut down, we transitioned to a different platform and kind of learned our way through that. And the committee meetings were closed and we had discussions in the past about um, streaming them and do we stream and some members of the board wouldn't be in attendance and having that information timely and not feeling behind. Um, but as we're on a new platform for our meetings and the public meetings, the full board meetings, they were, they were always broadcast. It was just participation from the public was a bit of a challenge in the previous platform. Now that we're at Zoom and we're, we're getting better with it and we have the closed captioning now, um, it's certainly something that the full board can discuss about going to open 
committee meetings again to allow that um, that visibility and and that concern out there regarding that transparency. It's it's absolutely something we can discuss as as a full board. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Neary. And then back to the live questions. Okay. Uh, it looks like we have M back. Ms. So Neary. Yes. It's eight o'clock. It's okay. seven fifty-seven. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Mahan. Thanks, Dr. Mahan. Um, M, I think we have M back on the line. So if you can state your full name and address. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, my name is Michelle Feinberg. I live in Chanticleer in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, my question, um, I understand that some of the teachers have been going above and beyond. However, with my third grade son, I'm not seeing that. So I am wondering how is the district going to assess the teachers and ensure that they are upholding the fidelity of the curriculum? Um, are the principals or administrators monitoring the online classes and visiting teachers, sitting in on them while they're teaching from home? I know from the principal at my school, she has not attended any of my son's Google Meets. I know she has not attended other grades Google Meets. And I'm just wondering who is assessing the teachers and who is verifying that what they're doing is getting across to these students, especially the younger grade students who can't advocate for themselves that they're not understanding the material my son does not understand, you know, he can't sit in front of a screen and on a Monday have a two hour break with nothing to do. So who's assessing these teachers? Thank you, Ms. Feinberg for your questions. Um, the administrators do the assessment of the teachers through an evaluation process um, that is ongoing. There are statutory requirements that we have to follow in terms of the number of evaluations that take place each year. As I mentioned earlier in the evening, we have a um, district evaluation advisory committee. Um, evaluation has certainly looked different this year um, due to the volume of remote instruction. Um, those evaluations, um, some started back when we were in the hybrid back in November. Uh, other evaluations uh, started last week and this week um, with principals you know, visiting classes, which are a snapshot. Some of that is similar to what would go on uh, in a typical school year, um, you know, where a principal in a building would make visits to classes, not necessarily in the class all day long, um, but, you know, make visits to classrooms. If there are specific questions, uh, I do encourage you to reach out to the building principal directly. Um, you certainly could follow up in an email with me or with Dr. Mahan, um, and we can have additional discussion um, to address and talk about your concerns. But I appreciate your call. Um, submitted questions. This one is from Jennifer Surrey, and it is, when will students on remote model be able to change to hybrid? Um, students on remote model can change to hybrid. You just need to contact building principal. Um, if you are looking to make a change, we had asked parents to make a commitment um, through the end of January. Uh, additional information will go out tomorrow just with that same information to parents to consider where your children placed or if they are on remote and you'd like them to transition to hybrid. Um, here's who to contact in the school. If they're on hybrid, you'd like them to can transition to remote. Same thing, here's what to do. Um, that'll take us from February 1st is uh, basically the beginning of the second half of the year through spring break. We'll have a check-in again with families um, as we approach spring break for the last quarter of the year as well. But contact the building principal if you have any specific questions. And then Mrs. Neary, back to live. Okay, next we have Therese DiMedio. Good evening, Dr. Malosh, Dr. Hi. Ben, Hi, um, Barbara, Steve, Ms. Neary, Dr. Morton, um, Jen, and the rest of the panel. Um, I, number one, want to just thank you guys for hosting this. As you know, I think it's a, a great forum. I just wanted to remind anyone who's listening, and I did you know, talk to Dr. Malosh about this or email him, that this is a pandemic. And I respect the fact that he acknowledges that. And in amidst of the learning that may or may not be happening, which I'm sure is, this is a pandemic and health is the most important concern. Nobody will care whether your kid passed fifth grade if he didn't live to see through it. And I know that sounds harsh 
and abrupt, but that's the reality of the situation we're faced in this um, current pandemic. Please remind parents that as you trust in us to provide fidelity in education, we hope that we can trust you and your fidelity to send children to school when we return healthy and in doubt. Contact your school nurse, contact us. We're here, we want to help. We are your allies. So please, in, in the event you don't know what to do about sending your kids to school, please send them, keep them home and call us and we will partner with you in maintaining their health and the health of your family and their um, school community. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Take care of yourself. Thanks for calling in tonight. You as well. The next submitted question comes from Jody Schneider. Uh, and the question is, how will you prevent asymptomatic spread? Are you doing surveillance testing? What are you doing to ventilate buildings? Um, so we talked about surveillance testing. We are not doing surveillance testing. Uh, in terms of preventing asymptomatic spread, uh, we will continue with our mitigation practices, reminding our staff, reminding our students, um, following the, the social distancing, the proper and appropriate hand hygiene, and the wearing of the mask, all so critically important. I don't know yet that there is a great answer that's been published or put out there about a, a surefire way to prevent asymptomatic spread, um, but that certainly is one of our goals in terms of keeping children separated um, and maintaining that distance. Um, and then what are we doing to ventilate buildings? You know, so we have, uh, we have an indoor air quality program that's been fully operational. Um, in our buildings, we have unit ventilators. I'm sitting next to one in my office here. I can hear it running. There's direct damper to the outside that draws in fresh air. These run throughout the course of the day, 24 hours, which is circulating air in the classroom and offices and other spaces in the building. There's also just about a thousand ventilation fans uh, that are in the ceilings in our buildings um, that are in operation throughout the course of the day and throughout the course of the night uh, as well. Dr. Malash, can I jump in too? Yes, yes. Thank you, Ms. Case Abner, please. Um, just to piggyback um, on that and on what Terry said, we're worried about spread in both ways. What you can do to help us prevent is teach your children to wash their hands, proper wearing of their mask, and maintaining social distance for one. And for two, the guidelines from the county have become a little more stringent in terms of sending your child to school. Any symptom that could mimic uh, COVID or is consistent with COVID may or may not be because normal cold symptoms and allergy symptoms mimic it that uh, you'll be required to take your child to their pediatrician to get them tested. So when in doubt, if your child's sick or you have any questions, when in doubt, let them learn remotely for the day. They won't miss the day, but they'll be um, learning in the remote setting and it will prevent us from having to interrupt their day, sending them mm -hmm. home on a shortened school day. That's a great point, Ms. Case Abner. Thank you for bringing that up. And if you do run into that situation, even if your child is supposed to be in school, they can always log on. There, there would never be a reason your child could not log on. If it's something that it's gonna be multiple days and you wanna make that transition from the hybrid to remote, again, contact your principal. Um, but if a child, if they have to stay home, can always log on and see that live instruction during the course of the day. Um, I think we are back to live question. Ms. Sneary, does that sound right? Yes, I think so. Uh, the next person we have on the line is B. B, if you could state your full name and address. Person is, they're coming in, it says they have an older version of Zooms. Here they are. Does not appear that there is a microphone that is associated with this. Um, again, it says this person has an older version of Zoom. If you are able to come back in in another way, um, you can certainly call in to ask, but it does not um, appear that we're gonna be able to have you ask a question. Yeah, and I think V is, I think v is struggling. So if V can call back in or dialing in, we might be able to get through that way. Yes. 
I can move on to the next one then. Uh, the next person is Lauren. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, it's Lauren Greenberg, 508 Bryan Drive. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm extremely happy that we're gonna go back on the 19th and I pray that I will not have to disappoint my elementary age kids 24 hours before we go back by telling them it's been changed. Um, but, you know, there's been so many studies done about the spread not happening amongst schools, particularly in the younger grades, particularly in elementary. And these elementary kids need more than two mornings a week of, of in-person instruction. I mean, is there, is there an end goal to eventually get, particularly the elementary kids, back in the classroom full-time at some point this year, or is this just a wasted year? Thank you, Ms. Creamer, for your question. Thank you for calling in tonight. Um, so as I said before, absolutely the goal is to get, uh, the, the ultimate goal is to get all of our children back in school with all of our staff members at the same time, um, you know, and, and to do that in a manner that is, that is safe and um, productive and beneficial for everybody that's involved. I would never say that this is a lost year um, with the work that our staff members have done to adjust uh, instructional methodology and approach um, and what they're doing with students. Um, there's a level of resiliency that exists. Um, we're finding that, that there are students that are, um, not only there are there students that are struggling, but there are students that have been uh, incredibly successful as we go through. We need to make sure that we are moving every child forward and every child has an opportunity to find that, um, to find that success. You know, some of the, the pieces with bringing more children into the classroom at times, uh, at a time are structural, you know, and, and those come from the direct guidelines that come from the state and through the Department of Ed um, with, the, with the recommendations about social distancing, um, you know, and, and what that looks like, you know, so it's, we work with the information with which we are provided, um, you know, certainly advocacy at that level with, you know, our elected officials, um, you know, is, is always beneficial, um, but we have to, you know, go go through and deal with that uh, in terms of making sure that we can do the best we possibly can with the information that we have that's been provided. And health and safety, um, you know, are, are always going to be our, our primary responsibility, um, you know, when we're talking about dealing with our students and our staff members, you know, so the goal is to have all students back. Um, I, would, I would not tell you that I am overly optimistic that that's going to happen before June 18th, which is our last day of school. I appreciate you calling in. Um, and thank you for continuing to be involved. And then a submitted question from Jen Green. What proactive plans can you share with regards to providing incoming middle schoolers with a sense of their options for the 21-22 school year? Uh, normally this is something um, fifth graders approach with great excitement and curiosity. So I'm wondering what's planned to replicate that experience if virtual. And in the private sector, as the financial year is about to close, leadership often reflects on wins and opportunities the past 12 months before it so to optimize forthcoming endeavors. What learns from 2020 will the board take into 2021? What would you tell parents who remain conflicted about whether or not Cherry Hill Public School System is indeed right for their family? Um, so Dr. Mahan, do you wanna talk about um, middle school, the uh, with fifth graders, rising fifth graders in the sixth grade? Dr. Or Dr. Scott. Malosh, Dr. Yep. Mahan um, is having some technical difficulties. So she, uh, I think, ended up leaving and is going to try and come back into the call. Okay, well, then we'll hold off on that and see if she is able um, to get back in. Um, but the second part of the question, I would say there's, there's a lot of learns uh, and things that we have learned from 2020 that we take into 2021. Um, the first of which is operating a school district raising children surviving in the midst of a, of a global pandemic is hard um, and it's exhausting and it's frustrating and it's filled with disappointment and filled with challenge. Um, I think that is at the top, would be at the top of, of everybody's list as we go through. Um, and I would also say that, that we've learned that um, we have students and staff members and family members you know, who have continued to, even through the disappointment rise, um, you know, to address a new day and the next day 
um, have changed their outlook and their perspective um, on what they can do on a daily basis, what they can accomplish, what it means to be successful. Planning and preparation are always, in criti are always critically important. Communication uh, is always critically important. It's something we talk about quite frequently. I think one of the other things that the pandemic has shown very bright lights on for us as a public school district um, is that there are people at, at both poles in terms of how they view and approach dealing with the situation. Um, and there are some incredible challenges that many of our families in our community and many of our children are facing on a daily basis. And honestly, by the grace of God, you know, that they show up for class um, every day, you know, has become incredibly evident by what we've experienced and, and what we have seen. Um, you know, in terms of the academics, again, learning in a different manner. Um, and, and we have seen this in the past as we have dealt with families who have come from challenging situations, you know, new to our school district or children who are arrived at different times during an academic year or children who have been very ill and have missed large portions of academic years about what it looks like to catch them up as individuals, um, what supports they need and, and what it is that we can possibly do. Um, for parents who remain conflicted about whether Cherry Hill is the right school system for their family, you know, I, I encourage you to speak to your teachers, speak to the, the counselors, speak to the nurses, speak to the building principals, contact me. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about the school district. I think that uh, that's an incredibly important decision for families to make. Um, I can also tell you that, you know, as we look at school districts in Camden County and in Burlington County, you know, while it may look different from the outside, the inside typically does not look dramatically different with the challenges with which they are faced. Uh, Cherry Hill has not been unique in the experiences, um, you know, that, that we have gone through. Mrs. Weathington, do we, have we heard anything back? Uh, we have not, Dr. Malaj. Uh, I can only share that I know we are in the middle of transitioning uh, and, and creating and preparing for eighth graders to do their course selection for ninth grade. Uh, after we are finished with that process, we'll be talking about fifth graders doing their course selection for sixth grade. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot offer more than that. I apologize. And Dr. Yes, and, Malaj and, and Mrs. Dr. Neary, I just want to offer you a time check. It's 814 on behalf of Dr. Mahan. Thank you, Mrs. Wellington. Dr. Morgan, because I know you guys, you have something set up this yes. week for your, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I was just waiting for you to finish. Yeah, so you know what? So we are trying to mimic the uh, the information nights and the transition, you know, to, to, to support the transition process. So this Thursday, we actually will be doing a Q&A with uh, eighth grade families. Uh, myself, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Perry from, from East will, will be involved, as will uh, a few other staff members also to answer questions and to you know to give you additional information and then later this month uh we'll be hosting our visitation night so clearly we can't do the visitation night as we have done in previous years in person but it's going to be virtual for us so uh students will have an opportunity to do a virtual tour of west for instance um and they'll have an opportunity to interact with some of the different clubs and activities, the advisors of the clubs and activities via Zoom or Google Meet um, breakout sessions similar to what we're on tonight. Um, additionally, something, that's, something else that's really uh, important for our kids, they like to, to conduct shadow days where they come in and they visit mm -hmm. the schools, they visit East, they visit West and have an opportunity to spend a day in the life uh, at the schools. We're figuring out, we're trying to figure out how to make that happen as well. Um, naturally, that, you know, at the present time, that will be virtual, uh, but we'll see how things progress as we move forward in the coming months. Uh, so we are trying to adapt and, and change and, and still to facilitate the, uh, the transition process. I can also say uh, at the high schools, we, we do have students assigned to peer leaders or peer mentors. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the transition process these peer mentors will work with the incoming freshmen throughout the course of the school year, um, answering questions um, and, and again, serving as a resource for the kids. Great, thanks Dr. Morton. Um, I know that the middle schools, because I know that the question is screen, yes, specifically about the middle schools, um, after Thursday night, uh, we'll be working on the production for the middle schools for there. Um, it'll be done virtually this year, you know, as Dr. Morton talked about, Basically what Dr. Morton talked about, there'll be something similar that'll exist for the fifth graders, you know, who are getting ready to rise uh, as sixth graders as well. So good stuff, Dr. Morton, thank you for that. Mrs. Neary, back to live. 
Okay. And I really hope I don't do a terrible job on this name. Uh, Kimberly Jatserbensky. Rizembensky. And I apologize. I'm sorry. I know I did a terrible job on the name. That was pretty close. Thank you. <laughs> it's Yastrzemski. So it's Kimberly Yastrzemski and I'm on Ridge Road in Cherry Hill. Good evening. Good evening. So um, I apologize, with, especially with the curriculum. I, I feel like I'm a little bit in the twilight zone when we talk about our elementary kids because our younger kids. Um, because I don't understand how you can validly make an assessment with this platform as to whether these kids are meeting curriculum. I know they like to say that we're doing it with fidelity, and I do see that, but fidelity does not necessarily equal success. And as a parent, I'm very concerned that there's, and I'm not going to say learning loss, because I know they like to wax semantics with that, because they can't lose something they haven't gained. So, and especially with the, the essentials, reading, writing, and foundations, my kid has really not written more than two paragraphs, actually physically written two paragraphs in five months. And these are critical years for that, for them to learn how to read, to write. They can type faster, they can switch, but they can't spell a word that they're typing. Um, and it's concerning and, you know, they talk about Title I and all this stuff, but in my opinion, I think a lot of these really younger kids are, have a learning gap at this point when it comes to the curriculum. And how are we going to know that it's, it's a valid assessment of where they're at and if they really do need help over the summer? Thank you, Mr. Stramski. I appreciate you um, calling in. Dr. Mahan, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Are you back on with us? There we go. Yes, and I apologize for the delay. I'm having some of my own technical difficulties. Um, so excellent question. And when we talk about are we if there is um, a learning gap for our students, we need to think about that every year students enter our classrooms at different levels and teachers work to meet students where they are. So it's not always about curriculum and getting through the curriculum. It is about making sure that our teachers are appropriately assessing students, figuring out where students are in their learning and then moving forward based on where the student is and really working to close any gaps in learning that the student may be presenting with. That is not something new that we're doing based on the pandemic. That is something that our teachers do daily and have done for many, many years. So when we are thinking about if students need support over the years, we are continuing to provide informal and formal assessments for all of our students. So the teacher should be able to speak um, very effectively on where not only your child is, but all of the students in the class in regards to their learning. And I think Dr. Malash said earlier in one of his responses that I would highly recommend that you reach out to the building principal. You can certainly contact me at any time to talk about uh, learning gaps and any additional supports that could be available, not only for your child, but again, all students within the district. But teachers are addressing and meeting students' needs daily. Thank you, Dr. Mahan. Um, I had a conversation earlier this afternoon with parents from one of our elementary schools uh, who have two children in the district, um, and a very honest and real conversation about the frustrations uh, and the challenges they're experiencing um, as parents and that the children are experiencing during their time you know, about what that has looked like. Um, you know, we had the opportunity to, to talk through for about 45 minutes, you know, about what can happen, what could next, next steps be, what's going on with the teacher, what role can the principal play, what role can the counselor play. Um, involving other people in the discussion, especially at the, at the school level, is so critically important. Um, our teachers want our children to be successful, you know, and, and they are making that difference and doing what they can to make sure that they are. It's absolutely going to look different and feel different than it did for how any of us as parents went to school, regardless of when we went to school. And, and 
we are represented on the call tonight by you know different decades is when as when people were in school um but we're going to approach it it's going to look and feel different than it did for us so thank you uh, mr shensky for calling in. Do dr wash i'm sorry can i go back to the front that the same question i just want to follow up there was a piece in there about foundations yes. and i remind the parent that we assess that the we assess at the end of every unit in foundation. So teachers are collecting data throughout the entire academic year. And then also, particularly for K-1, um, as well as in second grade, teachers can provide modified running records and can use that data to target small group instruction to provide additional intervention and or enrichment for students. So there's two things to address because um, the parent did ask about uh, particular data and she also spoke about foundations. So I just wanted to circle back. Great, thanks Dr. Mahan. Mrs. Neary, um, before, because Dr. Mahan's gonna remind us in probably 90 seconds that it's 825. Um, I have, there are still a handful, uh, more than we will get through tonight of submitted questions. It appears that there are three, do you see three hands up? Yes. Um, maybe if we do the last three live callers, um, and then the submitted questions, we can prepare responses on an FAQ um, and list those. Um, if you, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think that works. I wanna be able to get to everybody that's still on the call waiting. Okay. And then if we have time, maybe do one or two that come from that list. Okay. Okay. So then next we have Jen Matro. Hi, thank you. I have a couple of questions. So my first ones are related to, you know, sort of the argument of needing to socially distance in the classroom, but yet opening up indoor sports and not opening up music programs and things, it seems a little arbitrary. Um, so I wanted to know if you could comment on that. And then my other question unrelated to the coronavirus, but related to opening school, um, you know, with hybrid plan to open next week, are there any concerns or plans in place to protect staff and students going to school with the current political climate and everything that's going on with that? Those are my questions. Um, let me just, Ms. Matcher, what do you, let me start with the second one first. What do you mean by protect students? Like, I mean, you're hearing about on the news, all of these various protests that are planned all over the country. Um, you know, I guess I'm just more, I'm actually more concerned about something happening along those lines than I am mm. about coronavirus. Okay, um, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. I appreciate you clarifying. Um, so let me talk about the schools. We have a, a, a very well-developed security plans for each one of our 19 schools, uh, as well as for our technology and facilities site. Um, we have district director of security, Mr. Anthony Saperito, uh, who reviews those plans. He's the direct liaison. Um, between the district and the police department. We have nine campus police officers, um, two at each of the comprehensive high schools, one at each of the middle schools, and then two who are roving uh, among the elementary schools and the administration building. Um, our buildings are locked down um, throughout the course of every day. There's only one uh, direct access for any visitors. Uh, and during the, the time of COVID, um, we're not welcoming visitors, honestly, into the buildings. Um, you know, unless there is a specific need that a parent, you know, would have to come in and all meetings are being done virtually. Um, you know, in, in terms of protests, and, and certainly we have had students who have engaged in protests. Um, I, I believe in, in Dr. Morton and Dr. Perry and the work that they do with their staff and with their students um, to engage them, to make sure that the students are safe, um, should they choose to engage in something like that. Um, you know, but again, our, our buildings are closed and secure. Um, security is everybody's responsibility, health, safety, and security, and that primary focus in terms of um, what we look at. Um, in terms of socially distancing in the classroom versus having sports um, that are uh, operational, again, we, we follow the guidelines that are provided to us by the state, um, both by the Department of Education and when it comes to sports, um, NJSIAA, which is the New Jersey State Interscholastic Athletic Association. Um, you know, Mr. Brow, who's the director of athletics for the district, um, has worked incredibly diligently in preparing the plans for the sports and worked with our coaches um, and worked with families uh, about specific guidelines that have to be followed. We had about 1,600 students between the three elementary schools, the two high schools uh, involved in our fall athletics and in the marching bands. 
um, and we're very successful in terms of mitigating um, you know, spread within a team. There certainly were children um, who were involved in programs that ended up COVID positive if we did not have spread uh, within the team. So we'll continue to follow those guidelines. Um, it's a choice, you know, and, and practices began today for basketball, bowling, and cheer. Um, but it's a choice that families can make if they have specific questions. Encourage them again to contact the building principal, uh, school nurse, or Mr. Barrow as the director of athletics. And thank right. you. I mean, all. my question isn't really so much about running athletics. My question is the fact that you're not necessarily running other things. And my children are involved in theater and they're not sure if pit orchestra is going to play or if they're going to be able to sing, but yet sports are running. Um, and I just feel like there's not, there's not the, the statewide push for sports doesn't translate to a statewide push for the arts. And I just find that a little arbitrary as far as what is allowed and what isn't. Yeah, I listen, uh, I understand the frustration in dealing with what comes out, you know, from the state and what the guidelines are and, and how they come out. Um, you know, we continue to follow them is, is, is what's provided for us. Um, the arts are incredibly important in Cherry Hill. They always have been, they'll always be a part of, of what we do. Um, I know that our staff members, uh, and again, the buildings have been very creative in how, you know, they have worked to um, maintain uh, and to produce shows, you know, that came out. There's still, again, there have been hurdles for them to deal with, um, but we continue to follow what those guidelines are that are provided for us. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ms. Macho. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Moss, I, you know, I would also add, you know, like when we look at, if we take education and schools out of the equation, let's look at where we are right now. You know, professional sports are occurring, right. but concerts aren't. You know, so it's not just, you know, like I think sometimes we, because we're in education, we're hyper-focused on that. But, mm. you know, the NFL is running, the NBA is running, the NHL is starting, you know, baseball will start up, you know, and, you know, nobody's going to the movies, nobody's going to concerts, nobody's, you know, those things, you know, those other pieces of the arts, you know, are still not up and running. So it's not, you know, it's not necessarily a state of New Jersey thing or a Department of Ed thing. You know, I think just globally, you know, there is that difference right now with what goes and what doesn't go. And right. Kwame and I, you know, Kwame was my principal. He, we talk sports all the time and, you know, they've had, you know, their pitfalls in professional sports and getting that up and running and, and things that have happened, you know, that, you know, we had a team last night that, you know, played without a coach, you know, it's the same as, you know, a school who ha loses three teachers, you know, Kwame's down three, three of his players, you know, so it just, I, I just, I think sometimes we tend to forget the global picture as well sometimes. Excellent. Thanks, Mr. Redfern. Uh, Ms. Neary, back on the, the live side. Yeah, I believe we have Jessica Simk Simkins. Hi, um, Jessica Simkins, uh, 208 East Tampa Avenue. Um, a quick short question. Um, I, I'm gonna actually undo this. My earbuds is not so great. Oh, that's really better that's, for you. That's yeah. much better, Ms. Simkins. Thank you for doing that. I saw you leaning in. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's much clearer. <laughs> it, it's a quick question. Um, <laughs> I had seen uh, in the fall going back and forth on what kinds of masks were allowed in school. And there was a discussion on net gaiters and whether or not they were allowed. I know um, one of my, okay. I know that um, like the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia doesn't allow them in any of their facilities. Right. Um, and I, I was wondering like what the, what factored into the decision on allowing them in the schools? Yeah, good question. Um, Ms. Simkinson, thank you for calling in and, and for asking. Um, so we went through the summary, actually went back and forth with Gators, where at one point um, we had said that, that Gators would not be permitted. Um, and then one point when we got additional information, you know, that, that came out, um, the net Gators would be permitted, um, you know, to, to go through. Um, you know, the only thing that we have identified, I believe, that's still, in, and Dr. Mann might be able to tell me, that's still in our We Return to Learn plan would be masks that have vents on them um, are not permitted because, again, that allows the... Um, you know, saliva or, or the air particles or, you know, the, the aerosol to um, be released um, from the mask. Uh, but gators are still permitted um, to go through. So again, it was a determination, you know, in discussion with the Department of Health, um, you know, and then with the available information that we we're able to secure. 
Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Simpson. Okay, it looks like we have two more. Next is Vivia. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Nalash and everyone. Thank you for everything you're doing with uh, the changing uh, situation. Uh, my question is uh, related to the remote students. Um, so my, my son started sixth grade and uh, though he you know, has missed out on uh, the live one, but I'm grateful for a lot of uh, things that are uh, happening, like the teachers conducting it uh, so effectively. And uh, uh, for once, I do feel that uh, this remote gave us a little breather to transition from fifth grade to sixth grade. Um, my question, real question is that, how will, and I think we will continue to be remote this year. How is the curriculum handled in between, uh, um, you know, shifting from hybrid students going back uh, to their homes and, and while the students are still uh, remote? Um, thank you for calling in tonight and, and thank you for the question. Because we have it set up at this point where it's live instruction, so uh, whether the child's in the classroom or at home, they're experiencing the same instruction at the same time um, to maintain that, that parallel piece um, in terms of what takes place, that all the children have the opportunity to see the teacher, whether it's in person or in a virtual sense, Monday through Friday to maintain um, continuity with the class and maintain progress in terms of what's taking place um, in the lessons as well. Dr. Mahan, you want to jump in with that? No, the only thing I was going to add was that all lessons will be asynchronous. So they will be synchronous. Synchronous, excuse me, will be synchronous. So um, students in the classroom will receive, yes, <laughs> sorry, synchronous. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, yeah. <laughs> I apologize. Everyone will be synchronous seeing this. live all at the same time happening. Yes, synchronous live. We have um, also purchased to allow teachers not to be. Um, stationary at their desk all day, webcams for every classroom in the district, as well as wireless headsets for um, to increase communication with the students who are hybrid and students who are uh, fully remote. So we're looking forward to continuing synchronous instruction starting on Tuesday. Thanks, Dr. Mahan. And I think we have one more person on the line, and that would be Jamie, if you could state your full name and address. Good evening. Yes, my name is Jamie Marchese. My address is 307 Royal Oak Avenue. Um, I have three boys at Clara Barton Elementary School, kindergarten, second, and fourth grade. Um, and before I ask my question, I also want to say that I know this is a very difficult time for everyone. Uh, I know that everyone, uh, Dr. Milosh, I know this is a difficult position for you to be in. Ooh. Whoop. Jamie, we got, you were muted there for a second. I'm muted, okay. There you um, go. I was just saying that I know that you're in a very difficult position that regardless of which decision you make, uh, there's a portion of the population that will not be happy. Um, that's just the, you know. Yeah, you're, you're correct. <laughs> how things go. So I, I, I do understand that. Um, and I, um, I do appreciate our teachers have been unbelievably amazing. I know people have mentioned this already. Uh, I'm a great supporter of all of our teachers. I love them dearly. And I think they've been doing a phenomenal job. Um, with that given, my children are still struggling. Um, three little boys in a house 24 <laughs> seven in elementary school is difficult. And I'm just wondering, um, honestly, can you tell us if the schools are gonna open back up? We just need to know if they're gonna get a chance because those three days were amazing. The three days that they had those four hours even, they were happier then than they've been in months. And if they're going to open, what are the chances of them staying open? Um, and honestly, I mean, I have one child with ADHD. 
but I think of these other special ed children and wonder what are the chances of them going back five days, the kids at Barkley, the kids that have IEPs and 504s. Um, I'm concerned for these children. I mean, I have one child with a 504, but you know, we'll manage, but I, I'm ultimately even more concerned for other kids in our district. And again, I understand that we're in a pandemic and health is of utmost importance. But then I look around and I see other districts that are, that have had kids in school. Um, I mean, we have tons of friends and family that have been in school, both full-time and part-time in private school, public school, charter school. Um, we have family um, in Italy who they've been in school, they've pri prioritized schools and have kept them open. And so I, I struggle with this and just, I'm, I'm really curious to know if, if Cherry Hill, if, if the district is committed to opening or not. And if so, what are the chances of us staying opened? Thank you, Ms. Marchese. I really appreciate you calling in and I appreciate your, your questions. Um, you, you used a word in there that I, that I think is so incredibly fitting you know, with, with what we keep talking about and that's struggle. Um, yes, are we committed to opening? Yes, next Tuesday, January the 19th. Um, again, based on the information that we received from the county, based on the numbers, you know, that the, um, we're Camden County and the Southwest section of the state were trending last week. We believe that we're still gonna to continue to be orange next week uh, as well. So we are set to open. Um, our staff is set, the staff has been preparing and planning. The date was announced, like I said, back on November the 20th. Um, our goal is to be open and to remain open you know, for the rest of the academic year. The only thing that would, um, as, a, as an entire district, the only thing that would close us down um, would be a significant change uh, in, the, in community health. Um, you know, that would be what would close us down. Um, will we look at, and, and this comes, in, and I think you know, your, your question leads to it, but it comes through you know, some of the submitted questions, you know, that as we are open, um, you know, should there be a problem at a individual, in an individual classroom or school, will we address that school as individual? We will, absolutely, you know, in, in terms of what goes on. Um, you know, if there's a, a problem at Barton, we'll address the problem at Barton. If there's a problem at Beck, we'll address the problem at Beck, um, you know, to go through and make, the, make decisions and determinations based on that. You know, the, the children, and again, this is in Genesis, um, you know, through the parent portal, the children that have been identified to be in school Tuesday through Friday, you know, that A, B cohort, you know, and, and both of them listed to go through, um, you know, they will, beginning next Tuesday, be in school Tuesday through Friday, you know, to come through. Again, if there are specific questions about individual children or, um, you know, what that looks like, again, talk to the case manager, talk to the counselor, talk to the teacher, talk to the building principal, um, are always great folks, you know, to involve in those discussions. Um, and, and I appreciate, you know, and, and uh, the, the, you're willing to take the time and to tell your story, um, you know, and it's, it's not different from, you know, many of the discussions I've had with so many families, you know, going back into September. Um, and this, like I say, struggle has been such an incredibly important word. And I think so, you know, fitting, um, you know, to describe what that experience has been like. Um, so uh, I'm grateful for you taking the time and for being with us this evening. Um, Mrs. Neary, as I said, there are a number of questions. There's still a couple of pages of questions. You know, so we will put these together um, you know, and, and okay. responses. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you and to Ms. Friedel um, you know, to do some um, just closing mm -hmm. thoughts. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanna thank First of all, I'd like to give that parent a, a virtual hug. I, I feel very much for them and completely understand uh, the difficulty. Uh, I wanna thank our administrators, our staff, the parents, the families, um, the kids. You're doing a great job. I'm sure you're feeling as defeated as everybody else and hang in there to our families, hang in there. It feels like forever and for some of us, this doesn't end when the pandemic does, but for those <laughs> where it does, um, it isn't forever, even though it feels like an eternity right now and you guys are doing a great job. So um, pat yourselves on the back, do what you can for yourselves. Um, and thank you for joining the call and giving your feedback and thoughts. It's, it's much appreciated. Ms. Friedel and then Ms. Uh, Stratton. Um, thank you. I I echo um, Ms. Neary's uh, 
uh, comments. Thank you to the administration, the parents, the community, the teachers, um, everyone who's on the call. Um, I, you know, I, I too will just on a personal note say that this has been a struggle in my family. Um, I have two daughters and they are both struggling. Um, but I do want to say, reach out. Um, you know, my oldest is actually at West, so I've actually had conversations with Dr. Morton. Um, as a parent, um, I see from the participant list, I see some guidance counselors and case managers. Uh, nobody has the answers because this is new to everyone, but they really do get it. They, they, they hear your struggle um, and they are working. We haven't found the right answer, but <laughs> we are working at, at trying to figure it out. Um, and I think also we just need to breathe and, and remember that this is a uh, global pandemic. We are not alone in the struggles. Uh, the, the, the learning gaps are statewide, not just in Cherry Hill. This is something that the Department of Education will be, I'm sure, looking at statewide to, to try to address all of these less than ideal learning situations. But really hats off to our staff, our teachers, our maintenance, our security, everyone in the district um, working together, we'll, we'll get through this. We're gonna have some hard days and we might have some easier days, but, but we'll get through it together. So thanks for joining us tonight. And then Ms. Stratton. Sure, uh, I just would add uh, first, thank you to everybody for taking the time out tonight. Um, and everybody that joined the call, parents, caregivers, um, staff, everyone that's here to, to just be a listening ear, which is why I joined this evening. Um, and, you know, I echo the sentiments of Lori of understanding. I think the one thing I've been going through this whole time having, uh, I have three sons with me home and one that's 18. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm, we're all feeling the same thing. We are all flying this plane um, and building it at the same time. And that is no small feat. And uh, one thing I've been just saying over and over to uh, staff, coworkers, uh, and even family members uh, is to all please have a little bit of grace with each other. Uh, offer some grace for yourself uh, because this, no one knows what to do. And we're all uh, super, just need to be super comfortable with being very uncomfortable with every decision. Um, and there's nothing that's going to uh, be, be the solver for everything. So uh, thank you everybody for your time and, and for your transparency. Uh, I encourage parents to please continue to ask questions, uh, continue to tell us what your, your needs are so that we could help. Uh, and then, um, we can all just collaborate in the best way possible with the same intended outcome, but knowing that there's gonna be twists and turns along the way. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sneary. And thank you, uh, Ms. Friedel. I appreciate your, your words as we finish up here. I've just posted on the screen, um, we have a thought exchange that I am hoping can be seen. Yep, there it is. Um, we have a thought exchange that'll launch. Um, it probably launched within the last couple of minutes. Um, just with a follow-up question, as we look back on all our remote on our all remote learning format, we transitioned to hybrid. What has worked well, and what areas do you need more support? Um, this will stay open until next Monday, so we encourage folks to participate. Um, remember, it's there's anonymity when you submit information. Um, you know, please make sure that you use this for the as a tool for the way that it is intended to share your perspective. And also to go through and then rank um, whether you agree or disagree with statements that are also made. Again, I also want to thank everybody that participated um, on the panel tonight, uh, Dr. Morton, Dr. Mahan, Mrs. Wethington, uh, Ms. Adrian and Mrs. Sugars, um, Mr. Stefano, Ms. Case Abner, uh, for your time and for your knowledge and for your expertise, and certainly again to the board members. Um, and again, a special thank you, you know, to all of our staff members who are on tonight and we're out there preparing lessons and getting ready for school tomorrow. Um, Mr. Redfern summed it up. You know, if you get the opportunity, send a note, say thanks. Uh, let the staff member, teacher, nurse, secretary, educational assistant, whoever it is, let them know that you appreciate something that they did for you or for your child. Uh, means an incredible, um, means a lot. Uh, and thank you to uh, Mr. Plavinsky and Mr. DiCarlo from our technology department. This brings us to the end of our evening. 
um, and hope to see you all soon. Stay well.